London news agents. Amongst those 650, you know, 23 threats to kill. You know, if this was a village of 650 people, you wouldn't want to live in it. And yet we're asking people to step forward to play a part in our democracy. That was Matt Jukes. He's the head of counterterrorism in the UK. And today he's telling us about the threat to our democracy that comes from the intimidation of our MPs. Currently, 23 parliamentarians are facing live death threats. What is that doing to how they're able to represent us in their votes? What is it doing to our democracy? What is happening with the terror threat when so many young people now seem to be engaging in acts of terrorism and the statistics for the number of arrests astonishing? What about the state actors who are suddenly getting involved? It is a fascinating discussion on the widespread nature of the threat to Britain today. Welcome to the News Agents. It's John. It's Emily. And there is so much to ask the head of counterterrorism right now about the protests that are going on in our streets, about the threats to our state from other states done not through big scale wars, but through terrorism against the individual. We've also heard in the last few weeks about two parliamentary researchers charged under the Espionage Act. What on earth is going on there with MPs and their WhatsApp messages and those who work for them? And just last week, we heard about the failings of the police and a failure in joined up thinking after three murders in Reading. The judge coroner, incredibly critical of what the police knew but didn't share that could have stopped that man from affecting his deadly crimes. And also, what is the responsibility of the big technology companies with their end-to-end encryption, which means that if there is a police investigation, the police can't find out what the people have been discussing. And the radicalisation of young people online and how you can possibly tackle that. There are so many different areas to ask about where, rightly, you should be concerned. We don't normally delve deep into crime on this podcast we we leave it to others who frankly probably do it better but as we're coming on air today with Matt Jukes with us now a 14 year old boy has been pronounced dead after an attack on five people in East London in Hainault a man with a sword and Matt I guess you're also the assistant Met Commissioner we 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 need to try and understand what is going on here and whether the police have a handle on these random acts of violence is, is, I mean, this is foremost a tragedy, clearly for the boy's family, for the community, but are we, are we in a more dangerous place? I mean, the first thing to say is it's just the most dreadful tragedy and I'm sure, you know, all our hearts go out to the families who are affected. We see, don't we, and we could talk about statistics and we'll probably talk about some of those, but you know, each of those individual events is just you know a terrible terrible deep hole for families but the reality is you know this demonstrates that that risk is present it means we need to work harder and harder with local partners with local communities i mean what does that mean like bearing down on on a man with a sword i mean do you just do you just say that is about mental health or that is about anger in the community or is it about a gang I mean what how do you how do you bear down on that well the reality is we need to do several things we need to identify those who are the most prolific perpetrators of violence uh, and pursue them we need to go after where it's present gang violence and that's something which has been a real focus we need to ensure we're working incredibly closely with mental health services and if I look across to our work in counterterrorism, one of the realities is that presence of mental health is is really visible. It would be easy to talk about strategies. It's easy to talk about partnership. Today's a, just a terrible moment in life of a community and clearly in the life of a number of families. Yeah, but there is a perception, maybe tell me it's wrong, that the streets have got more dangerous, that there are more knife attacks, that it's less safe to go out at night, that there are more people with zombie knives or swords or machetes or whatever it happens to be. It feels more dangerous. Is that right? 
it's not right in many senses to say that the streets are more dangerous than they were. If you look at long term trends and there's lots of research which shows not just from police data, but from hospitals, from accident emergency, that the streets are getting safer over time. That has squeezed that challenge around tackling violence into a more concentrated group of perpetrators and potential victims and of course it's important to remember we're talking about street violence in this moment but so much violence takes place behind closed doors but you know there's a real determination in the Met to keep people safe on the streets of London but but also to really make an impact in their homes. And when you see some of the more recent cases that we have has been in the news um parliamentary researchers um up in court for apparently helping the chinese uh, an arson attack where the perpetrators are charged with working for a foreign government namely the russians are foreign states now bringing violence and chaos to our streets i think it's really clear that a series of authoritarian regimes around the country are pulling the strings of their state security apparatus to challenge, intimidate, harass their critics. And when they pull those strings, they pull away at individuals, at communities, journalists. In the case of Iran, you know, we have been working incredibly intensely since the situation in Iran itself became more fragile. Over 15 threats to life they're principally focused on journalists those who are critical voices and you know sometimes in the work that I do you might be accused of chasing shadows you know we see flickers of this in intelligence we take steps to protect people last year we saw the conviction of a of an individual called um, Magomed Dovtoyev a Chechnyan born man traveling on an Austrian passport who went to the premises of Iran International broadcaster in London and was clearly involved and has been convicted of hostile reconnaissance. Someone who was gathering information that would be useful for terrorist intent. And then we've seen, of course, and I won't speculate on the motive, we're still working through the case from just about a month ago, but we definitely see in the aggression of the Iranian state, parts of its apparatus, a real determination to silence people and to intimidate them. We're really clear the threats are potentially of assassination, of kidnap, and you know we have to send a very clear message, and we are, that those are intolerable acts. That type of state aggression was about 5% of counter-terrorism policing's casework when Samark was in my position. That's now 20%. Wow. So four times. Four times. Four times the challenge. If we look at our old legislation, we've just um, seen new edu- legislation come into place. If you look at the Official Secrets Act, so those questions about espionage, old school in some ways, spies. Um, we have made more arrests in the last year than in the preceding period. Of the, of the last five years, half of the arrests that have been made under the Official Secrets Act were made in the last year. So this all points to an intensification and an acceleration. And what's your intelligence of why? What are they trying to do? I mean, I think the, the the principal focus is to extend their battle, their authoritarian regime. I think that the, the bottom line is that China, Iran, Russia see their critics, their opponents in the UK as fair game. They see our homeland as an extension of their conflict um, and they will pursue them. So they want to silence critics and not just silence critics directly, but also lean on people who are in the UK with threats to their families who are still back in what would have been their home nation. So in terms of how you police that, how much resource is that taking up? Because maybe there will be an attitude among certain people in Britain that, you know, this is this is their fight. They're not really they're not really threatening Britain's national security. This is somewhere else. So I think, you know, what we've got here is both a threat to life yeah, we've responded to, with MI5, 15, more than 15, threats to the lives of Iranian journalists or those who are critics of the Iranian regime. So we've got threats to life, and, and somebody else listening to this might say that doesn't affect me personally. But it's not just a threat to life, it's a threat to our way of life. If 
democracy can't operate freely without interference from foreign states, if journalists can't report freely on the condition of the world without interference, I think all of our freedoms are diminished. And I don't mean in some remote way, um, but what we've actually seen is real attempts to undermine our confidence in democracy. And if that happens, then you know we're running into an election year. If that happens, it affects the way people vote, um, potentially, and... And you're worried about that? Uh, well, I'm, I'm concerned that people can see that there is a free and fair election, general election, uh, in the next year here. There are a number of regimes around the world who would feel they would profit if our democracy was diminished. So, you know, my day-in, day-out work is, in, is trying to keep people safe. Right, you've mentioned democracy, and we've heard in recent months the Speaker of the House of Commons expressing his fears that his own MPs, our MPs, do not feel able to vote in the way that they want to, particularly on something that is so emotive like the the Hamas-Israel conflict. Do you know for certain that there are MPs who fear for their lives right now? I mean, what, what sort of numbers are we talking about? Well, I mean, we're never going to speak about the individual measures or the situation of, of particular members of parliament. Um, but I know, because I've spoken to people in uh, everything from local to national government, that there are individuals who feel they're having to make choices about what they speak out on publicly because of their concerns about their safety. And you know, they also feel responsible for their families. They feel responsible for their constituency offices. And for this their is British employees. MPs who are changing what they say out loud or changing are, how they vote. I, I think are checking themselves in terms of the impacts. And I think the one thing I'm really struck by, I know it's you know it's really easy and, and popular to sort of uh, comment on politicians, and you know they're often um, get a great deal of you know public criticism if you like um, but I have seen some amazing public servants in public office and you know just as someone as a small d democrat as someone who's interested to play my part our part in upholding democracy you want people from a whole range of backgrounds to feel they can step forward into public life and I'll give you I'll give you this as an illustration that there are 650 members of parliament we've taken something in the region of 3,000 reports of concerns from them over the last 18 months and those concerns vary a lot of online harassment in particular but amongst those 650 you know 23 threats to kill you know if this was a village of 650 people you wouldn't want to live in it and yet we're asking people to step forward to play a part in our democracy so you know, I'm really, I am really concerned to share that absolutely, you know, with the speakers of both houses, with the parliamentary security team who we work with very closely. And we started and touched earlier on, you know, tragic loss of life of, of a child. And this is, of course, not about placing one life or its importance uh, against another. Um, but it is really clear that when members of parliament lose their lives you know as as we've seen it has a potentially chilling effect and um i'm deeply concerned that we are you know as a whole policing system we're bearing down on youth violence right through to bearing down on these threats faced by politicians i think that's the incredible thing about our system that we are across all of those all of those issues matt can we ask you about this really sort of extraordinary case. I know we can't go into the details because two people have been charged now, but they were both parliamentary aides. And I think they've been charged under the Espionage Act. And I guess this brings us on to more widely what is happening between MPs, their aides, and the kind of messages that may or may not be shared on you know, channels like WhatsApp. So... You know, you're right to say I'm going to steer clear of the individual case that's going through the courts in 2022. If I recall correctly, Christine Lee was called out in Parliament um, as someone working on behalf of the Chinese Communist Party to uh, interfere and, and influence um, the way people were, were performing their roles. So we can see in, in the case of the Chinese Communist Party an intent to do that and I'm certainly not speaking to that individual case, you know, which you've referred to or to, to others which have been in the headlines over recent weeks. But, you know, it does require really close attention 
you know, we talk about the phys- physical security of parliamentarians, but, you know, their online security is clearly an important question as well. They shouldn't be kind of sharing WhatsApp messages? What I don't understand. Well, I mean, I think that, you know, that, you know, we, we obviously do this work um, around MP security with the parliamentary authorities, with the National um, Cyber Security Centre. There's lots of advice for people in public office, for members of parliament about, you know, how to communicate. Um, you know, I mean, what... are you trying to, is there a big <laughs> euphemism there? Are you, are you basically talking about MPs compromising themselves through the images that they're sending on WhatsApp, as we heard in the case of William Rag? I mean, is that where you're going with this? Let me be, you know, I suppose to be direct and without being as direct as to call out the individual case, you know, that's a flank of vulnerability we don't need. So stop we're, being so bloody stupid. Your words, but I think we're up against, um, you know, we're up against adversaries here who are determined and are looking for um, routes in to influence democratic structures, to influence um, politicians. What, and blackmail so, or bribery or influence how? Look, I mean, I suppose that, you know, if you were to speak to Honeytrap, that's as old as all forms of uh, espionage. But there's also the risk, isn't there, of people just getting onto devices through um, through the ways we're all vulnerable to um, to cyber attack in, in our lives. So, um, yes, we should be, you know, we should be concerned to work with Parliament to make sure people are operating, you know, in ways which, you know, secure their privacy and, and secure the privacy of... Um, our democratic process and our government. Now, I'm what, not what calling out What did you think when you heard that story? I mean, you're not going to say stop using WhatsApp, presumably, but, you know, when you... When well, you maybe you are. Maybe, maybe you are. I, no, I mean, these messaging platforms are ubiquitous, aren't they? So, you know, it's just a reality. I think we we would want and expect, you know, our own officers and staff to operate in ways which are mindful of the risks that are, are posed. So um, that's where I mean, we... They, that's they where don't, we famously. We've just seen they the case of the kind of um, WhatsApp messages that were sent over the... Yeah. The Nottingham killing. They don't, and I think you know that's been a that's been a point of really deep reflection. And I think you know we're all aren't we all at the point now where we should we're past the excuse that we're maturing in the way that we use those systems. You know, social media is not new, um, messaging platforms are not new, and so whether it's in the conduct of police officers who've terribly misused those platforms in a number of cases. Um, or whether it's in other the conduct of other people in public life, you know, right from the dignity of those who are victims of crime through to the integrity of our government process and democratic systems, you know, we should all be paying that greater attention to the way we operate online. I'm struck by something else you just said about young people. Am I right in saying that a lot of what you are dealing with now in terms of the terrorist threat is from young people. I mean, the really extraordinary thing, so I started my work in counterterrorism the week before 9-11. And at that point in time, we were we were operating against al-Qaeda. We were, um, you know, in the wake of the North, Northern Ireland troubles. Um, we, were, we were talking about tackling relatively organised, sophisticated paramilitary groups, uh, effectively. Wind forward to where we are now, one in five of the people we arrest, we arrested over 200 people for terrorism offences last year, one in five of the people we arrest is a child, is wow. under eight, is under 18. And, you know, I'm talking not just about um, individuals who are active online, of course, that's an enormous part of how they come to be radicalised, but actually boys and it is principally boys who have set out to actually carry out attacks who have got in their mind a target who have an ideology they believe they're pursuing so it's a it's a real concern and and at the lowest end I mean we are intervening with children who are as young let's say as 11 we're trying to find ways not to arrest an 11 year old and not deal with them through uh, the court system but by the time you get to a 15 or 16 year old um, involved in the depths of some of these ideologies. You know, we've got a real concern for the safety of the public. And, and how do you intervene in that? I mean, how, what do you do? Well, I mean, I, th- I mean, we are, we're, you know, we're bringing to bear um, 
our investigative resources, but actually in reality, and I think this is a big difference from, from the start of my career in counterterrorism. You know, of course we're working in our partnership with MI5, but now we need a partnership with child and adolescent mental health services, with schools, with colleges. It's a very different partnership that we're engaged in. So we, you know, we may have to pursue criminal justice. We might have to prosecute young people, but fundamentally what we want to do is get in earlier divert them and I think there's an enormous responsibility here I should say with technology companies because the reality is the reason this didn't exist as a phenomenon 20 plus years ago is there was no means for that information you had to travel if you wanted to learn to be a terrorist or you wanted to learn a terrorist ideology you generally found that in a place that's no longer the case you can do this in your bedroom and you say that in relation to children and radicalization that the tech companies are a problem. What should they be doing? What would you like to see them do? What powers would you like to have over them? So, you know, I think there's, I mean, you'd like to start, wouldn't you, with a sense of responsibility. Um, we've got, uh, Ofcom has now got additional powers um, through the relatively new Online Safety Act. Um, but, you know, we're in a situation now, it's never been like this um, in our history. We're in a situation where, that delicate balance between privacy and security is not being set through communities and through a democratic process. It's tech companies who are deciding where that balance between privacy and security sits. Um, so I think the first thing you know we would want them to do is act responsibly. So when they enact increasingly end-to-end -end encryption, it means they can step back from the awfulness that is happening on their platforms because they can no longer identify and report it. They can't see what we have been able to see in the past. Now, people would be rightly concerned if the companies or if law enforcement or if intelligence agencies could see everything at the drop of a hat. And of course, there are lots of post Snowden worries, you might say, about that. But what they shouldn't do is create not just dark spaces, but, but entirely closed channels which don't allow properly warranted, properly accountable law enforcement and intelligence activity. And I'm not just talking here about defeating the terrorist threat. Um, I mean, parts of this terrorist threat start to feel like child abuse in, in many ways because of the way they're happening. But I am talking about child abuse, sexual exploitation online. And I think in the last weeks, you'll have seen the Director General of the National Crime Agency marshalling European police chiefs around this very clear message that that balance between privacy and security should be set through transparent, you know, appropriate democratic processes, not by big tech giants who, frankly, are putting in these instances profit before safety. I think we have to talk about the times when it does go wrong as well, Matt. And mm. sometimes it really does go wrong. Um, and it's laid at your door at the police's door in Reading. Um, Three people died, and we heard yes. the report on Friday. And the judge, who was also the coroner, um, was very blunt about police failings there. And he said it's all about sharing. If intelligence had been shared properly, he might have been detained by the police. There's no point, I guess, um, pushing it onto the mental health services or the social services or whatever, although those are a, a mm. massive problem. If you know, if your officers know things, if MI5 is aware of this, if those significant failings have been pointed out by counter-terrorist police officers, why is this still allowed to happen? So, you know, that is the most awful case of an individual who, in many ways, never seemed to hit the thresholds or trigger the response in our systems that he should have done. And, you know, my heart goes out to the families who have listened to that evidence during the course of the inquest and shown such inc incredible dignity in, in doing that. In reality, we've got an individual whose mental health concerns were significant, but also had substance misuse problems and so wasn't responded to there, whose terrorist risk was identified, but was never seen as great enough to elevate him. Who's I mean, how can that be right? If you're a terrorist risk, what, why why isn't every alarm bell going? So I think the I know in this case there are indefensible omissions in the way that uh, that operated. Since that time, we have got in place multi-agency centres. We access 
clinicians now. So we're working, you know, we've always had this partnership with MI5, but now in our Cancer Terrorism Operations Centre and in other locations around the country, um, we've got clinicians, we've got uh, prisons and probations officers who are working with us directly. So it didn't work in the case of uh, the individual responsible for the attack in Forbury Gardens in Reading. And we should have done better in this case. It's worth saying, I think, to put this in context, that there are, through the year, dozens of people released into our communities who've got terrorism convictions or who have been of concern to um, the the authorities in terms of their extremism. We've got... A... That's quite, I mean, that's... that. You know, I think a lot of the public would be quite... Gasp at that. Yeah. yeah. Well, part of it is... I mean, I'm sure that's right. And I think one of the... You know, one of the difficult things and you sit in this seat in, in, in my job is that, you know, of course these things, they are really they are really stark realities. There are over 200 people in prison currently serving um, sentences for terrorist offences. They will be released over time. Part of the reason we saw a very significant number of prison releases last year was our past successes. They don't stay in prison forever necessarily. You're right to draw back to uh, the Reading attack. It's also worth remembering the the attack at fishmongers hall you know these are yeah. these are moments that have caused us to really have to pivot our approach from one um which was based on that core security partnership to understanding the enduring risk and you know people ask me quite often in conversations like this you know the what keeps you awake at night question or yeah. how, you know how do you sleep at night question and the thing that in many senses keeps me alert keeps me um steeled is that we have to look families in the eye families who've lost someone in these terrible events and say we're doing our best and doing better um that is you know a structural response in terms of investing with government in bringing these different elements together the joint terrorism operations center in london now is a world-class facility a whole host of over 20 different partner organizations there I mean, it's lived out in the way these cases are actually operating yeah, in, in communities i mean i get i get that you will talk about multi-agency approaches i guess the point is when when you know the rubber hits the road you might have as many mul- as agencies as you want if they're not actually speaking to each other and passing stuff on it's not working you know there is a lot of talk about a multi-agency approach and cooperation is it real it's really it's really very real lived out every day so um there have been mistakes I mean, there have definitely been mistakes in uh, a number of cases, but we've disrupted approaching 40 plots since uh, 2017. And that's the product actually of a very tight relationship. So up and down the country, counter-terrorism policing is working in nine different units around uh, England and in Wales with MI5 co-located. The counter-terrorism operations centre is people sitting next to each other and information flows on a daily hourly basis between the organizations so matt can we talk before you go before you leave us about um the protest which has taken up so much bandwidth um uh, of what policing has been Mm. about on the streets of london in the last six or seven uh months now i mean do you when you look at what's happening in london sort of from week to week do you believe that the protests are being underpinned by state actors do you believe that people are coming in from outside trying to cause trouble or do you believe that actually they're pretty legitimate i mean do you do you have regrets about the way they have been policed up till now if i can you know speak to my direct concerns about state involvement and about terrorism what well, we, we've made over 50 arrests related to terrorist offenses um since the 7th of october that linked directly to the conflict and about half of those relate to protest and about half of them relate to online social media posting. So this is the glorification and support of terrorism. And have I, you worked out in in that sort of space of arrest whether somebody shouting for, you know, intifada or somebody shouting the chants the river to the sea or somebody waving a Hamas supporting flag are are those terrorist incidents? So they'll, they'll they'll attract terrorist charges in some cases and already have and, and convictions. Some of them, yeah, certainly, as I say, you know, in the region of, of 50, the, the larger portion of those have been in, in London where we've seen the largest protests. You know, does that characterise the whole of the protest activity or the marches? Of course it doesn't. 
um, there there are clearly now frequent occasions where um, we've seen behaviour intervened with. You know, policing has become more robust, speedier at getting into these situations. We saw an individual convicted uh, recently for wearing a Hamas headband, for example, something purporting to be a, uh, a Hamas headband. So these cases are starting to come to the courts from the, the protest. I think there's a sense in which people think nothing has been done and nobody's been arrested. There have been something in the region of 400 what, arrests. What, what was your uh, feeling ultimately about the Gideon Falter interaction? This is the uh, head of the campaign against anti-Semitism who tried to cross a march and encountered a policeman. Where was your sympathy at the end of that? Did you think he had been provocative? Did you think the policeman had handled it badly or well? Can I, can I be frank and say where my sympathies are in this regard? I, I've spent time in places of worship since the 7th of October. The first I visited was a synagogue. I've been to mosques since as well. You know, My sympathy is with people who don't feel that their kids are safe travelling on public transport, that they'll be harassed. My sympathy is with people who are concerned about sending their children to faith schools, about attending their place of worship and, and feeling safe. I've got enormous sympathy for police officers who are um, increasingly finding themselves in that moment where a five-second clip of a conversation, which had gone on, I think, 13 minutes in that instance, yeah distorts a conversation that had taken place contains you know a word or two that was unfortunate but you know if we are in the business of keeping people safe it will include keeping people who are opposed and likely you know to to come to harm if they come together apart you know that will that will happen and i think genuinely sincerely that was that was happening so you your sympathy is not particularly with gideon falter from what you've just said there um you know it's it's hard, you know, I mean, I'm not suggesting I'm not sympathetic. And it's not, you know, he's he's got a perspective he's entitled to, uh, to, to voice. But it feels like that interaction has been mischaracterised. It feels like there's something deliberate about looking to engage that protest. I've, you know, I think it's cynical to, um, it's cynical to suggest, you know, in every instance, these things are a put up. Um, but it felt like it looked to a lot of people, I think, when they watched the, the even if he's video. trying to prove a point, even if he's trying to prove a point that he, he should be allowed to look as he looks and go where he wants. I think, you know, fundamentally, in the end, that probably not in that moment, a debate about whether that's the case or not. It's a debate. And it did turn into a debate clearly on the on the street about keeping two groups of people apart to prevent disorder or to prevent people coming to harm. And as I say, I mean, I think I've that we've seen something really extraordinary in the period since 7th of October that I imagine we saw after 9-11 over a much longer period. So we've seen three features, the collision of real concern about community safety and public safety. So hate crime, particularly a huge spike in anti-Semitic hate crime and an, and an increase also in uh, anti-Muslim crime. We've seen the risk of radicalisation being a question we've got to confront. And we've seen this question of whether any of that is being driven by hostile mm. state actors. Yeah. And we know from Iran's interest in the region that that must be present in some ways. Um, so we've got an enormously complex policing task to deliver. And I, I, I think it would all you know, it would serve us all well, of course, to pay attention to those individual interactions, you know, but also recognise just how well, week in, week out, those protests are being policed by colleagues. They've diminished in number. The The acuity of some of the instances doesn't go away. The harm and hurt caused by some of the criminal behaviour at the margins is clearly present. But I, I think there are more profound things happening in a very fragile world then reflected in a five second clip from the from the streets in that instance. Matt Jukes, thank you very much indeed for being with us. Thank you. Catch, Catch it. Catch it. Yeah. Out. Must be out. Is out. Terrific stuff from Monty Panasar. You can't imagine an orthodox left arm spinner bowling any better than he has done. No, you haven't tuned into the sports agents by mistake. This is still the news agents and yes 
We are going to talk Monty Panasar. I'll do a bit of wisdom for you. Not wisdom, wisden. Made his test debut, 2006 Nagpur. Uh, 167 test wickets. 12 times he took five wickets in an innings. Two ten, ten wicket hauls. And won the Ashes twice in 2009 and 2011. Uh, that's enough facts. There is something else, though, today that makes Monty Man at Panasar of interest to the news agents. Yeah, it is that he's standing for none other than George Galloway's party, the Workers' Party of Britain, in Ealing, Southall, at the next general election. So he has just been signed up by Galloway, a real agitator, a long-term, long-form Galloway, agitator. Galloway, that is, rather that than is Monty right. Panesar. Yeah, um, in the sort of far-left political scene. And Galloway, we understand, is unveiling some 200 candidates outside um, Parliament. And Monty Panasar is his headline act, essentially. Now, Galloway will probably have quite a few people to choose from on the left who have become increasingly disenfranchised, right, with the Labour Party. They've been suspended. They don't agree with Keir Starmer's more centrist position on Gaza and other areas. And I think Galloway is hoping to sort of hoover up to be honest, a few people who he think are leaning much more to the left than where the current Labour Party is. And Manasar is trying to unseat um, Virendra Sharma, who's been an MP since 2007. So, you know, 17 years and has got a majority of 16,000. And I don't know, could do it. We don't know. Look, if you want some lefty spin on this, you see what I did there. (laughs) who better to go to uh, than Monty Panasar? Um, there is a really odd bit about it. If I had played for England for 15 years, my CV would have that in shining lights, you know, flashing lights. I played for England for 15 years. On the CV for the Workers' Party, uh, he seems to have left that out altogether. So you have got one of England's most famous and kind of immediately identifiable test cricketers who is now standing for the Workers' Party, but making no mention of the fact that he was a bit of a cricket hero for quite a long time. It's amazing. He's also Sikh. He's appealing to presumably the one in five um, constituents in Ealing in Southall who are also of that religion, who are Sikh, trying to... Um, unseat Virendra Sharma, who is Hindu. Now, I don't want to make this into a sort of, you know, big sort of Indonesian religious contest. It may have nothing to do with it. But clearly, the way that he is choosing or the way that George Galloway is helping to choose who goes where is going to be very important. George Galloway famously always tries to fight for his own seats, the last one being Rochdale, the one he's currently in, Rochdale, in places with a heavy Muslim community because he feels he has the language to speak to people who feel very, very strongly within the Muslim community about Britain's foreign policy, quite often on sort of Middle Eastern matters. This discussion has underlined something rather tragic and sad. Emily Maitlis can tell you all about the makeup of every parliamentary constituency in the United Kingdom, and I can tell you how many wickets were taken by Monty Panasar. And who do they want to have to dinner? Not me. (laughs) (laughs) We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye. The News Agents. This is a Global Player original podcast. 